Watch, we see you from the room. Or uh, co-moderator Madeline, uh, who I hope uh, will be joining soon. So let's give it uh, a minute. Great to see all of you in Addis. About how many are in the room? Can you hear me well? Yes, all good. Uh, can I also ask support to make Madeline co-host, please? Definitely. Has she joined yet? I don't think I have seen her. I have her on my Zoom list. Good morning, Pablo. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, everyone. Madeline. Yeah, yeah please. <laughs> Who is speaking can uh, always turn on the camera uh, and, if necessary, taking the floor so <laughs> the technical support can also pin you and we can see you. Perfect. We have a big remote participation list, so uh, right now we're seeing you quite fine, but let's see if we don't make it too too much images. Yep. So I think we can start. Okay, great. Thanks. Thanks very much, Juan Pedro. Um, good morning, everyone. My name is Madeline Carr. I'm professor of global politics and cybersecurity at University College London, and. Uh, together with uh, my colleague Pablo Hinojosa, uh, Director of Strategic Engagement at APNIC. Uh, we're delighted to be moderating this session this morning. Um, wanted to start off by thanking Emily Taylor, Caroline Quiero, and Regina Fuxova, who organized the session and, and invited us to moderate. And of course, this session is part of the Dynamic Coalition on Data and Trust. So I wish we could be there in person, but um, but welcome to everyone online and on site. Um, ever increasing dependence on internet infrastructure is driving these um, discussions about DNS data. And we wanted today to begin a conversation on questions around DNS data as they relate to evidence-based policy making. Geopolitics and the perception that information infrastructure is not only critical to the functioning of society, but it's also vulnerable to the dynamics of global conflict and competition is prompting thinking about the, how the DNS may need to adapt to jurisdictional boundaries and what the possible detriments of that may be. Um, the DNS for EU uh, uh, initiative could be considered one example of that, that kind of thinking. Um, and of course, encrypting DNS data has, has been a response to privacy concerns, but it's also thrown up challenges for law enforcement, something that we've discussed in, in, um, in previous um, forums and, 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 and sessions. But really, who owns the DNS data? and how exactly it's governed um, is a question that we feel is also really important to examine with, with quite a critical lens because in some ways this ecosystem has grown up quite organically um, with adjustments and amendments along the way, but this is really a, um, in a sense a, a global good uh, that, that we need to think quite critically about how it is managed and who has access to it and for what purposes. Either way, the DNS is receiving increased attention from policymakers 
and standard setting bodies. But, but what data is missing to develop really evidence-based policies around the DNS that address these myriad and, and sometimes competing or conflicting demands the goal of this year's IGF conversation by the, the Dynamic Coalition on Data and Trust really centers around the development of DNS policies and standards, highlighting good practices within industry that use evidence to inform policy choices and different approaches to database decision making, as well as any gaps in, in data governance that may limit that kind of informed policy making, or indeed, uh, community scrutiny and, 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 and study or research. So we have a really excellent lineup of speakers here today who we feel can cover the, the breadth of the issues um, uh, that, are, that will feed into this. And we've also got time um, obviously set aside for online and on-site participants to feed into this discussion. And, and we hope to, to make it um, as interactive as we possibly can with the time allowed. Um, uh, to, to kick us off, I'd like to um, I'd like to introduce Jeff Houston um, to who who will give us a kind of broad overview of of the issues. Jeff has, uh, I'm sure most people in the room and on on the call would know Jeff has has been involved in these issues really from the beginning and has that kind of breadth of understanding and depth of understanding about the evolution of the DNS that I think will be really helpful to just set this talk up uh, from the beginning. Jeff, could I ask you to step in, please? Yes, thank you very much for that. And uh, look, it's a pleasure to be with you this morning, afternoon, or wherever you may be. I have exactly three minutes. I might go over by a few seconds, but I'll try and keep it at that. So let me dive straight in. Um, the DNS lies in, in a relatively obscure part of the internet. Um, and oddly enough, it might be obscure, but it's also incredibly simple. It takes names and translates them into network addresses, IP addresses to be precise. Now, all this seems quite innocuous, names to addresses, it's like a phone book. But there are a few aspects about this function which have been used and abused by many over the years. And, and this abuse, lies at the heart of today's issues with the DNS. You see, this particular protocol is quite old. It was devised in the 1980s, and it follows the pattern used by many other protocols at the time. It was completely open, not cryptid, didn't bother to authenticate who it was talking to. At the time, you see, we weren't constructing the future global communications infrastructure, not at all. This was just a small scale experiment in packet networking done by a few researchers, predominantly in the US at the time, if we're talking the 1980s, and a couple of other countries. So the DNS didn't need to be armor-plated. It was trusting. Now, we took all of that protocol and converted it into a global network. Oops. And in retrospect, the DNS in particular was overly trusting. And indeed, I think the best word is credulous. Um, any determined adversary uh, could intrude upon the DNS, they could observe what was happening, and they could tamper with the answers. But at the time, you see, in the 1980s, why was this a concern? This was just a research project. Why would they ever want to do that? So when the DNS kind of grew up into this world of the global internet, it was actually a vulnerability. If I could tamper with DNS answers, then I could misdirect you. Or, or claim that the sites and services you wanted to get to don't exist. Now, many national regime, regimes have and do use their regulatory powers to compel ISPs to actively censor the DNS in this manner. Pretty much every country these days, very widespread. But perhaps more disturbing, particularly to the technical community, was the revelations of 2013 from, uh, from Snowden which showed that the DNS was being used by some US agencies to perform mass surveillance at an unprecedented scale. You see, everything happens with a call to the DNS, literally everything. So if I was able to observe your DNS query stream, you have no secrets. I know everything you're doing online and with whom in real time. I don't need to know anything else about you. If I know your DNS, there's no secrets left. Now, 
The technologist's response to these revelations, you could argue was extreme, perhaps even hysterical, but it happened. And they erected a new set of protections around the DNS. DNS messages are encrypted. Sources of information are authenticated. DNS content is now verifiable. Tampered DNS responses can be recognized as such and discarded. It's hard to accept a lie. These days we're looking at perhaps the most complete measures with obfuscation. No single party can correlate who is asking and what name they're asking about. It's not that that information is well hidden, it doesn't exist anymore. So when we talk about the policies around DNS data in such an obfuscated world, let me point out that if we go down that path, there is no DNS data to talk about. It just doesn't exist. So the, the upshot is the DNS is going dark, extremely dark. It's actually unclear what this means in the long run. Do bad actions and bad actors go undetected? Do we lose our visibility and network management? What's a secure network and how do we secure it when all the traffic is opaque? If we can't see inside the DNS anymore, how can we tell if it has been captured by one of these digital bear moths? How can we assess the competitive health of the DNS as a market for providers and consumers when the entire thing is deliberately obscured? In closing, I would point out there is much to think about here and whether the reaction to this 2013 publicized abuse was, was in scale or not is kind of irrelevant. That reaction is causing its own set of issues now, which are actually commensurate with the original problem that started us down this path. And it's a new set of challenges we now have to grapple with. Thank you. Thanks very much, Jeff. That was a terrific um, uh, scene setter. Um, I want to turn now to Mallory Nodal from the Center for Democracy and Technology. Mallory has um, a long background in um, uh, consideration of issues um, of technology from a, a, a user's perspective or a public interest perspective. And she has a, a, lo a long kind of legacy of work in um, issues of privacy and technology. So Mallory, could I ask you to, to step in, please? Hi, everybody. Thanks for the introduction. Thanks for inviting me. Um, so yeah, I wanted to just talk about from my perspective, um, what this group you know, talking about DNS um, and private DNS should be considering. Um, so from a technical perspective, and Jeff did a lot of the work here, I just wanted to point out that, you know, the DNS, like, you know, global routing directories, I mean, these are all global rendezvous, rendezvous services that applications need to function. That's all they are. They're databases that have to be distributed lo um, globally. Um, and so we need to query them, our applications need to query them from time to time. There's no reason why that should be global data. There's no reason why anybody should know when my applications ask this global database for details on where to find a website or other service that other people should know about that. And it's pretty easy now, we've found, to just obfuscate that and hopefully authenticate it too, right? So I think the perception that this is going dark or that now we can't get access to all of this, you know, data that was once sitting around for free for other people to look at is a bit of a strange framing. I think it's just that it wasn't really locked down before and we didn't really think about how um, it could be private and authenticated and now we have done. Um, and, it, and that's a good thing overall. Um, so the, I guess the other point I would like to make though is in, because we've had to transition, obviously, the new technology has been introduced, either DNS over HTTPS or TLS or Quick or however it's done. Um, basically, however an application has decided to query this global database, however that's done, doesn't really matter, um, that's been a transition. And so in that transition, other things have inevitably kind of broken or needed to adapt. And there have been some tensions there. And I think from a public interest or a human rights perspective, it's been helpful to confront those issues and those tensions rather than pretend like they don't exist. So at some point, um, me and a colleague, Siobhan Khal Sahib, who works at the Brave browser, um, we developed a paper. We never really published it, but we took it to a few different um, 
workshops, I guess, just to talk about it. We identified a few places where this was coming in tension with things. And I'll just highlight the areas for you and then you can um, read more about them or we can have a conversation about some of them throughout the panel. And I'll be quick. So the first was around competition uh, because, and, and centralization actually is the probably the term from a technical perspective, meaning that a lot of the, the um, people or the services that were being provided that actually um, helped to protect and make private DNS lookups um, were not, it was not an ISP innovation. It was not the usual actors that came up with this and implemented it first. So it did seem at the beginning that there was a lot of centralization of this provision um, with content delivery networks and that sort of thing. But that's changed. That was pretty, that was a pretty easy fix. Now a lot of ISPs offer it and it's more, uh, it's, it's, it's back to being a sort of decentralized service. And there's some, I'm not going to minimize it. There are still some concerns with that. Um, another one, though, was also in tension with um, abuse mitigation. So um, it was a, DNS data was a convenient way to um, interfere with um, sort of abusive behavior online, either uh, malware, spam, a variety of different things. So that there are still some issues to be worked out, but I think that actually providing the private lookup by services has helped. Um, because they would have access then to that um, to that lookup data. Um, another one, of, and I might actually be forgetting a couple. Sorry. Another one was um, accessibility concerns. So some there were some tools that folks needed um, to access the internet in an accessible way, either you know, screen readers or other kinds of things that were based on domains. So if those were even in your browser as a um, add-on or something, those sorts of things were, were disrupted and needed to reconfigure how um, they could be invoked automatically for those, um, for those users. Um, and there's a sort of ongoing sort of tension with privacy and security features that interrupt those features. So um, it's an area of work that we also were looking into. And then I'll just say the last one is that it probably exacerbated some of the worst censorship cases around. So another way that um, DNS data was being abused previously was it was used to block and filter. Um, and um, obviously there's some people are going to try to circumvent that, right? Um, so I think what happened was when um, there were censorship regime, regimes really used to using DNS as an easy way to block and filter, they then had to sort of ratchet up their um, censorship. This didn't happen everywhere, um, but in, in um, regimes that are very motivated, they're now just wholesale blocking um, certain kinds of of uh, traffic because they can no longer interfere with the DNS. So that was an unforeseen consequence and I think something that could have been thought through a little bit more um, to avoid um, that because it's now, I think in some places it's it's worse, DNS blocking is, or, or blocking in general is worse than it was when it was just DNS blocking. Uh, so those were the those were the high level ones, but I'm happy to dive in and I appreciate the extra time that I took, sorry. No, thanks very much, Mallory. That was really helpful. I appreciate you setting out those those kind of tensions and conflicts because that's a big part of this conversation. Um, we'll turn now to Jordi Ipaguiri from, from URID who um, is going to talk a little bit about some sort of quite concrete policies and initiatives that that they have introduced that, that um, link to this conversation. Jordi? Yeah, thank you very much. Happy to be here too. Thanks for the invitation. Uh, yes, exactly. We're going to talk now about uh, another level, which would be not the domain, uh, sorry, the DNS itself, but the domain names. And I would like to share very briefly some things that URI does, so the .eu registry, some, some practices related to the evidence-based policy. Something that we as .eu do because our framework allows us to do that in terms of legal framework and, and capabilities and whatever, but something that may not per se apply to any other TLD around the world. Okay, so each one is different. Here, one size does not fit all at all, at all. So uh, we have maybe two different things here. The first is the, uh, are the external factors. On one side, the legal framework in which URIT has to work, for instance, the contract with the European Commission, our local law in Belgium, or the European law, or GDPR, or whatever. Another one is our own concern about customer care. That is, we would like to prevent as much as possible harm to users of the .eu space. And then also the brand protection of the .eu space itself. That is, if something happens with the .eu domain, that somehow is also harming our brand. So we want to take care of that and prevent it as much as possible. 
Then the internal factors, what's inside the domain space and all that. So usually, well, we, we, we do take care about that and we look to different activities that taken place into the .eu space. So from time to time, we see exchange activity. Okay, let's call it strange web domain names and, and websites that may look abusive. That would be, the definition of abuse would be something that we would not recommend to family and friends, okay? We are not getting, we are not going to get into the content as for free speech. We get, if need be, in content in terms of possible harm to third parties, okay? Harm to your health, uh, harm to, 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 well, to your consumer rights, harm to your savings uh, and all that. So these are maybe the two sides that we have to take into account. And then how do we develop that? Well, different ways there. The first ones, for instance, uh, keyword detection on domain names itself. Mm, during COVID, the European Commission sent us a list of uh, strings that we had to look for in order to uh, find out what was happening with those domains that contained those strings basically to prevent uh, consumer uh, harm uh, and health issues for, I don't know, web shops, for instance, selling uh, fake uh, masks or vaccines or, or whatever. So that would be one way to go, okay, keyword detection. Another one that we have running uh, since a couple of, almost three years already, is uh, abuse prevention and early warning system, that is analysis of the domain names uh, at the registration time and also after registration trying to identify which, which of those can be harmful or are based on our expectation, uh, knowledge, sorry, harmful. And then we start the know your customer procedures. That is, do we need to, we ask the registrant to verify, to provide uh, some proof that that person is the one that they say it is. Okay, we, we need to know who is behind that domain name. Not because we are curious, but because of the agreement between the registrar and the registrant uh, is based on that. Okay, you, you are an owner or you are renting a space of the internet and we need to know who is behind there. So for that, we have different uh, developments there. Maybe the latest ones are checks with sending an SMS or a micropayment to a bank account mm -hmm. or asking you to use the electronic uh, uh, ID card to, to, to know who is behind that domain name. And finally, uh, well, uh, in parallel to those checks on the who is data, who, are, who is the person that's behind or the company that's behind that domain, we may share certain domain names that we deem suspicious of harmful activity to third parties, like for instance, law enforcement and cybersecurity professionals. Okay, we do not have the mandate uh, to, to, to suspend domains based on content. We don't do that, but we do share domain names that could be seen as abusive based on the definition before okay something that you would not recommend to your friends and family so uh we share that with the professionals of cybercrime and they will decide what to do with that you block them at the dns level if bring that to court is if sending that to well to the police and then asking us to suspend the domain so th those are uh, the four branches in which we develop those policies based on the the content and the data on the dns and the registry and that's all thank you very much Thank you very much, Jordi. Uh, I will take um, the moderating role for a bit here to introduce uh, Adibi Oladipo. Uh, Biji, welcome. Uh, you have been involved in Nigeria CCTLD operations, and we welcome your perspective here. Um, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to look at this from also looking at them from four basic points. Uh, and first, um, it's a perspective, not just from Nigeria, but across the African continent, which is, first of all, um, how are CCTLDs managed in, in, in Africa? Um, there are various models that are used and uh, a number of them run around contracts in collaboration with governments. So we have a model where you have multi-stakeholder organizations running the CCTLDs, and, but they have MOUs and contracts with the governments to run those names um, on behalf of the internet community. However, there are developing um, 
scenarios where governments actually take over those names and take over the running of the CCTL days such that the organizations that were running it before now begin, are no longer the ones and the governments run the CCTL days directly. So this has implication around the governance of the CCTL days and um, discussion and, and the brings of conversations around how free and how easy will it be to get domain names and things registered. Um, while we don't have that issue in Nigeria, we also have, um, of course, we need to start thinking about what if it happens and how this will run. Uh, and this brings out um, concerns on how we want to ensure that the DNS is free and um, domains are free and easily accessible for, for people. Second issue is around data privacy and protection. Um, while the EU has the GDPR on the African continent, each country have their own responsibility for data protection laws and data protection issues around um, their own domains. And, and uh, when I say domains, it says around their own, their own um, jurisdictions. So since there's, there's no central um, responsibility on data protection, each country would have to come up with their own. And this is one, I think it's one opportunity for evidence-based policy making in having the specific is running those um, the DNS system in those environments to come up with proper protection regulations that would assist people who use the internet in those places to know uh, or who um, buy domain names and, and use the domain names to know what data they want to put out there. Um, and of course, this has um, implication around the who is data and how it is being protected. It is in line with um, security um, on, on the internet. So you ask people how, who gets to see what and who owns what. Um, and this has implications around what policies are we going to adopt and on what principles are those policies going to be adopted. If you look at the, the way policies have been done basically around most of um, CCTLDs in Africa, one of the things that you find out is that it's either they're based on what is happening elsewhere uh, in terms of like best practices. And then also, you also ask yourself, but the other thing that is also happening is a lot of those policies are intuitive. However, I think more and more, we need to start looking at how to use the evidence-based system in coming up with those um, policies around security. The fourth thing that I will talk about is about collaboration with law enforcement, which is at what point do um, DNS is get, uh, domain names get taken down? Uh, I, I know that for the .ng registry, we've had requests severally for people to um take down certain certain domain names but we have not acted on such not because um we don't see what it entails but we don't have a policy that says we could take down any domain just like that but collaboration with law enforcement would help to identify where threats are coming from and where people can um gather data in order to help us to say, oh, okay, these are the policies that we need and to bring up, come up with definite policies to um, tackle abuse and also be able to cooperate with law enforcement. So these collaborations are important. Um, I remember that on the African continent, there's actually a coalition coming together with law enforcement to tackle abuse and um, but basically dns takedowns could be possible in some places but in most places in africa it is 
feel not um, a hub. So I'm going to stop there, and then we can take we can take other things. Excellent, Bigi. Thank you for uh, talking about the uh, special uh, policy and regulatory issues uh, that uh, registries such as country codes are faced and the collaboration with um, government that is required. Uh, Peter Van Ross, the general manager of Center, the Association of CCTLDs, country code top level domains in Europe, welcome. Uh, so we are having a journey through different operators of uh, DNS registries and um, uh, through that journey we will continue to regain those threads um, that uh, we started at the beginning with Jeff and Mallory. Thank you Pablo, good morning everyone. Um, I was asked to, to speak uh, for three minutes about DNS for you which is an interesting element in, in this discussion as it captures quite a few of the threats that previous speakers have already touched upon. Um, so just first a brief in, uh, explanation on, on, on the DNS and, and what that resolver function is. So as Jeff explained, almost every action that a user uh, executes on, on the internet will involve at one point a DNS lookup. So that's the resolution of the, the name uh, in, um, in in text entered through uh, um, an, um, a browser or in an uh, email address uh, and translate that name to a IP address, which is what computers use to communicate with each other. So um, in order to do that lookup efficiently, um, there are servers that perform that task. Um, their only function is to answer these queries. And so these are called recursive resolvers and, and when they're open for everybody to use, so not restricted to say a company network, um, they're referred to as uh, public recursive resolvers. So that's that's just the, the background and I, I do realize I'm, I'm cutting some corners there. Um, so this was at first a very pragmatic way to improve uh, query response time, um, but um, as was already um, pointed out by previous speakers, it also became an interesting point of data collection. Uh, as Jeff pointed out, when you look at somebody's DNS uh, queries, you can learn a lot. Um, it's not so much about personal data, but it's the aggregated data that gets together in these recursive resolvers that becomes very valuable. You could see which, mar which uh, websites, for instance, or which domains are trending up, which are popular. And, and of course, uh, search engines uh, are very interesting to, to, and very interested to match that data with uh, the queries that they see coming in. Uh, secondly, that's the second aspect uh, touched upon by Mallory, it's that the DNS is uh, being used uh, more and more as, as a filtering tool to protect users from, uh, from uh, phishing attacks, uh, smishing attacks even, um, but also in a, in a, in a global uh, effort to increase cyber security, typically on a geopolitical level. Um, the interesting thing, however, is that there is no business case for uh, recursive resolvers. Uh, people who run them spend quite a lot of money on them. It's a public service. Uh, and if you cannot um, uh, make uh, use of the data that that uh, service is generating, then uh, it becomes uh, actually uh, quite expensive thing to do, especially for smaller ISPs. So still, despite the uh, the pressures from GDPR, we see that uh, some players get more and more interested in, in collecting that data. Um, and we see um, consolidation in that space. What was once a very healthy and fragmented market uh, becomes more and more consolidated. It's probably not as bad as some people seem to think, um, but we, we are talking about numbers up to in the range of 15 to 20%. Uh, of uh, of uh, market share that is captured by the larger players. So what about Europe and how do Europeans use recursive resolvers? Well, probably not knowingly. Um, I do not have any friends who would even know where to make those changes. And that's an, maybe an interesting point for the later discussions uh, in the panel. So about around 15 to 20% use a service that is not provided by their ISP. Um, so by default, you, uh, you, you get assigned a, um, a, um, a DNS resolver uh, from your ISP. Uh, 15 to 20% of users will, will not use that one. Um, 
it doesn't tell the whole story because in addition to those 15 to 20 percent there's probably quite a few smaller isps that lean on external services to provide that service to their customers so it's difficult to estimate but probably around 30 to 35 percent is is a realistic uh, number those so those, those public resolvers will typically be not European. So those 15 to 20% will typically not be not be European. Uh, Europe, uh, Google is capturing the lion's share um, of that uh, amount. And that number is trending up slowly, but surely trending up. So enter the DNS for EU. Suddenly the uh, European uh, institutions realized that um, what they consider to be critical infrastructure, the DNS and the operators running it, um was uh, was seeing an interesting and well an interesting and from their perspective a scary market effect um i do believe that when jeb pointed out to the 2013 discussions and then the response from 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 the technical community in particular the dns over http uh, which uh, which makes it impossible for uh, for some of the intermediaries to see the internet uh, and the dns traffic flowing um there was an, a, a discussion on, on the security aspects of it, but also on the, the market aspects of, of it. Um, and I think that that was what mainly triggered the whole dns for u plan. Um, we believe that the, uh, and so what is the dns for u It's a uh, um, public call for tender by the European institutions for a party to run a uh, European wide uh, uh, resolver, as I just described at the beginning of my presentation. Um, and that would be open and free to use for every European, but would obviously uh, be applying all local and uh, all local jurisdictional uh, rules when it comes to blocking. Um, in general, we believe that that was um, a good and positive move. Um, it, uh, I, I think most people understand the uh, importance for European institutions to ensure that European infrastructure is less dependent on non-European players. Um, but there is obviously also a very important uh, geopolitical uh, security function to that. Um, we believe it creates more choice and diversity, which is good. Um, we see different flavors in Europe. There's already, I, I think, more than 30 or 40 um, uh, public resolvers that are listed and, and more are, are being added every quarter. Uh, so the DNS for EU will be just another one instance, uh, and that can only be applauded. However, it's important to, to know that this can only be applauded uh, as long as nobody gets an ID to make some uh, usage of that DNS for EU server mandatory. Um, that would undermine completely the point of the diversity and the resilience, that's for sure, but it will also undermine user's choice. Um, the good thing is that, at least as far as I know, I know in Europe is even considering that ID, uh, but uh, an important pointer to make on this. Um, finalizing, center members looked into the opportunity to uh, jointly bid um, uh, during that call for tender, uh, but in the end we decided not to do it uh, because we believe that we can add to the diversity without having to rely on the bid. Uh, and so um, even, uh, even add more diversity, more localized functions and resilience to the system. Um, the latest, to, to add on a positive note, the latest uh, instance that, uh, that was just announced, I think last week, was uh, a Lithuanian uh, initiative. Um, and I think uh, with them, we have already about a dozen uh, European uh, CCTLDs uh, being a, a partner or even running uh, their local instance of a, uh, a recursive resolver. And that's it for me. Thanks so much, Peter. That was um, that was really helpful. And and to pick up on those uh, those kind of commercial elements that you've introduced and and, and um, questions about uh, diversity and um, consolidation in the market, we've got Carolina Aguera now. She's um, an academic at the University of Duisburg Essen and also at the University of San Andreas. And and Carolina has uh, uh, research currently underway. I understand on. Um, some of the issues around mergers and acquisitions in this in this market. Carolina, thanks for joining today. Hi, 
Hi, everyone. Um, thank you, Madeline. Um, I won't be uh, speaking about that research here, um, but I will be bringing in some a uh, bit of a flavor on uh, the discussion on privacy in the DNS and, and what is um, happening in Latin America, um, which is uh, very much not uh, evidence-based um, in terms of, uh, of data being created by, by the region on this uh, issue. Um, operators, um, different ISPs, um, um, CCTLDs, um, LACNIC, etc. they're the technical community in general, I would say, has been uh, very much uh, enlivened by this debate in the last four years. And um, there, there are very cautionary notes to be to be said about this trend from a developing region, uh, very much in line with a, a bit what uh, Peter and Jeff and and um, Marjorie uh, developed earlier. I mean, there is uh, this. Um, I mean, in a in a region that still relies uh, very much on 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 a very large international providers, etc. There is uh, this awareness that the internet is becoming more and more centralized by by the big tech. And behemoths, and so um, the the concerns, which are very legitimate, uh, concerning uh, privacy in the DNS, uh, is not being coupled with an with a with an architecture with a possibility of actually enforcing um, uh, that privacy or, or generating that understanding. So um, while there is, I mean, um, I think that APNIC has uh, done a fantastic uh, a fantastic job in mapping some of these trends of uh, concerning the adoption of of uh, protocols to protect the privacy of the DNS at a global level. Um, in the region, there are some experiences uh, in, in, in Brazil, in, in Chile in particular, and um, but, but there is still not enough data. So one of the, um, actually there's very little data. So one of the issues that is being raised is actually uh, working uh, on on raising um, at a digital, uh, at a citizen level, but also at the policymaking level, a greater case for uh, this particular issue, uh, which is uh, of course in very much in conflicting views with uh, practices that are not widespread of uh, DNS blocking and, and internet shutdowns at a, at a regional level in Latin America. There are some experiences still, as, as you may be aware, but still the intellectual uh, property protections over DNS blocking and, and, and the World Cup recently has uh, sparked these debates again and again. So um, I would say that we are still at a very early stage in terms of getting reliable data for evidence-based policy making uh, but there are is a scattered uh, community that is getting a bit stronger and 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 pushing for uh, a better approach at understanding what privacy in the dns can and may mean for operators in the region thanks very much for that carolina really helpful um, I'd like to bring in Keith Drazek now from, from Verizon. Keith, I, I think you could perhaps um, speak a little bit about the different roles, responsibilities and capabilities of, of the various actors in the DNS ecosystem, which, which might help at this stage. Yeah, thanks very much, Madeline. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Keith Drazek. I'm Vice President of Policy and Government Relations at Verisign. Uh, Verisign operates two of the largest top-level domains, GTLDs, uh, in .com and .net. Uh, we participate regularly in the ICANN community as GTLD registry operator. We have contracts with ICANN to operate these zones, these top-level domains. Um, I'd just like to sort of reinforce, as we talk about data and as we talk about um, engaging, engaging in uh, the DNS from an operational perspective, that there are a number of different layers, there are a number of different operators engaging at different layers of this hierarchical, uh, this hierarchical engagement, right, this, this ecosystem. Uh, and it's very, very important as we start talking about data and, um, you know, access to data, tracking data, using data for things like DNS abuse mitigation, that uh, we recognize that these different actors have different roles, responsibilities, and frankly, operational capabilities. Um, and that we need to make sure that we, as we engage in 
DNS abuse mitigation strategies and policy development and regulation that we understand and recognize what those various roles, responsibilities, and capabilities are. And whether it's a registry at the top level uh, selling domain names at the second level through registrars and resellers, uh, whether it's hosting providers, hosting service providers, uh, maintaining the content, uh, IP address uh, registries, um, that there are a number of different operators and actors in this space. And each one of those actors has a different uh, role, responsibility, and capability. Um, I can say that uh, over the last several years, I've been very much involved in the ICANN community, working uh, to try to identify uh, improvements uh, around DNS abuse mitigation. And I say DNS abuse, that's a term that's being used quite broadly, uh, and it's probably not specific as it needs to be, but in the ICANN space, as it relates to GTLD registries and registrars, um, we're very much focused on DNS security threats that are not content related, um, but there is a need to focus on content related abuse. But largely, uh, the there needs to be further engagement, I think, in those conversations in a multi-stakeholder way around, um, you know, the abuse that relates to content uh, that actually belongs outside of ICANN. So I think um, there there's a range of uh, in a range of actors and a range of responsibilities. Um, and I will say, I'll, I'll drop a, a link into the chat here in a moment, but the GTLD registries and registrars uh, have recently at the beginning of November sent a letter to ICANN uh, organization, ICANN CEO, uh, basically saying that we are prepared to take on additional obligations in our contracts in the GTLD space uh, to require further action as it relates to mitigating DNS security threats. Um, I think this is an important step, but it's not the only step. And there needs to be um, uh, additional work and additional tracks of engagement in discussion when it comes to mitigating the wide and broad range of abuse uh, as it relates to the DNS, whether it's using the DNS for abuse or um, uh, you know, abusive activity that relates to the DNS. Um, so I'll, I'll make sure I drop that in, uh, in the chat here in a second. So I just wanna note that uh, I think this is a really important discussion. I think as we as registry operators and registrars engaged in the domain name registration and resolution process, um, data is very important to us. Evidence-based reporting when it comes to uh, requests to mitigate abusive activity online through the DNS, through uh, you know, basically taking a route out of, uh, out of the zone, uh, doesn't necessarily remove the content from existence. It simply removes a path to get there. Um, and we need to make sure as registries and registrars working closely with hosting service providers, law enforcement, civil society, other groups that we understand what it means to take action at the DNS level when trying to mitigate a broad and wide range of abuse. Um, so I'm going to stop there. I uh, definitely look forward to the Q&A and the, uh, the engagement. Um, happy to take any questions as well. Thank you so much. Keith, no, thank, thank you. you so much. Go ahead, Papo. Madeline, I think we have a very widespread of uh, DNS related issues here. Uh, we started with uh, DNS data and also uh, how the DNS has evolved uh, from uh, sort of open secrets to uh, absolute obfuscation uh, in terms of technology, but also in terms of uh, human rights and competition and concentration. Uh, we then kind of moved towards the registry side of things. Uh, so we have Jordi at URIV, uh, doubly uh, regulated by the European Commission and ICANN. Uh, then we moved uh, to the CCTLD space in uh, Nigeria. Sort of they are uh, mostly ruled by the set of agreements uh, within their own jurisdictions. Uh, we went um, to uh, Peter uh, talking uh, from a perspective of the call uh, on the DNS resolver and how it works. 
uh, we went from the heavily regulated contracted party uh, at very sign and uh, good questions from Carolina. So what do we do with it, uh, Caroline? Um, Madeline, how do we um, uh, work uh, an open mic, but also in order to steer the conversation towards um, something useful for the dynamic coalition? Well, I think we could start by perhaps bringing in Emily Taylor, um, see if Emily's got a question that she'd like to kick off with. I can see some hands going up um, in Zoom. We've got Regina online moderating and also Wow in the room. So uh, let's throw to Emily Taylor first and, um, and then we'll start picking up some other questions. Oh, thank you, Madeline and, and Pablo, and thanks for um, such interesting remarks uh, from um, from the widespread perspectives of the industry and and academia as well. I had a question about you know picking up on Keith's point and 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 Jeff's earlier in the session about the availability of data for researchers. And Madeline, this is something that you and I have encountered, isn't it? In in trying to understand the impact and uptake of, of encrypted DNS data is that you have this real patchy landscape. So the ICANN contracts compel the publication and the public availability of a lot of data, which is, a, which is brilliant for policy researchers and possibly not understood enough. And on the other hand, if we want to understand what's going on in the resolution space, it's so hard to get hold of that data. And I wonder whether that, you know, I'd like to, 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 to ask the panel's views on whether that, you know, is almost like attracts policymakers to the wrong thing, because, you know, we inevitably get drawn to where there's data, right, you know, or where there's information. And, and there's this big sort of uh, very, very opaque um area which is so vitally important to understanding behavior so i'd really welcome uh, the panel's guidance and views on that thanks emily i think we've got um let's collect a few questions and a few comments shall we pablo to 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 get the q a Excellent. going i um, saw mark's hand for a little bit but then um I'm not sure if you would still like to participate uh, Mark, go ahead, and then we will go with Nigel in the room. Mark, that is, that is God speaking. Nigel, would, would you like to speak first? Yeah, and let's skip a cue, then uh, go ahead, Mark. Then Mallory also wants to give a few points on this direct uh, subject, and then Nigel also have um, another t subject to touch upon. Let's I, do it that way. I, I have broader points, so if you'd like to keep keep on this discussion and then come back to me that would be fine yes i'd appreciate that mark please thank you so then mallory if you could address the topic and then and nigel yeah sorry about the q confusion i just wanted to respond to emily's question because i it was one of the things in my um when i was recounting the sections of my paper i forgot to mention which was measurement of course um the um measure like in the transition to more private encrypted dns we've disrupted a lot of key measurement functions and the measurement community that i'm familiar with it's very robust um there's the uni probe the m lab the censorship plant censorship planet um a lot of those folks feel very strongly that um this is a challenge that they can overcome technically to continue to measure network effects in particular censorship, even though DNS is encrypted, they understand that it's made their job slightly harder, but they're up for that challenge. And I think that that's important um, to discuss in terms of the trade-off. Um, but I also haven't, hadn't um, in my remarks talked about the, the who is database. And I think that this comes into um, Emily's question, which to me, this is a similar sort of um, thing to the DNS lookup data. I mean, it's, it's really a contractual transaction between people who buy domain names and the registries and registrars and, and ultimately ICANN. And to me, there's not really a reason why, other than the fact that there is some centralization of that database, that it should be in any way public. And I know I'm a little late and the, the ship has sailed and there's a, there's a way that folks can get access to that. But I would just want to make the parallel that the IME not, IMEI numbers, when you um, enter a contract with a mobile uh, telecom for many years and in many jurisdictions and still even in the United States just about a year ago, there are always proposals to make this a centralized database that 
um, law enforcement in particular could easily query who's got which IMEI numbers and, and what are they doing and, and we can fight crime that way. And it's always resisted because of course it would be a gross violation of, of privacy and have a lot of implications. So why we resist that but not um, domain um, registrant data, I've never quite understood, but um, those would be my points on that. Thanks. And back to the, I guess, the, the rest of the intervention. So thanks for that. Thanks, Mallory. Um, I'm sorry, between Mark and, and Nigel, did we settle on who, who wanted to speak next? Yes, and now Nigel, I think he uh, will present some points that uh, he was actually <laughs> invited to speak in. So if you go ahead, just. Thank you, Nigel. Yes, thank you very much. And uh, thank you very much, Pablo and uh, Madeline, for inviting me to uh, 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 say a few words in this, uh, in, in, in this session. How many, how many governments are there in the room? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Well, I, you know, it's good to see good to see one other government. I'm Nigel. I work for the uh, UK government in the Department of Culture, Media and Sport. Uh, you know, first of all, I'd like to say that you know governments in general are uh, are greatly, or our policy making is greatly enhanced uh, through the contribution of many of the actors in this room. You know, from from Centre, from URID, through the Oxford Internet Institute from CDT and, and many others. The expertise and of course, Jeff Houston, who uh, I often refer policy makers to in terms of his articles on the, on the DNS. So governments have a role. We might be on the outside, but we are listening. And I think this debate this morning that we're having shows us the importance of government's understanding what is going on in the DNS. It shows us the importance of being involved in the discussions. Now, my minister in the UK, and I've had many internet ministers that I've had to deal with in my time in, in the UK government. Ministers change rather more frequently than, than officials in the UK. But if I went to my minister and said, oh, I want to tell you about DOH, and I want to tell you about Quick, and I want to tell you about Apple Relay. He'd probably say, Nigel, I'm really fed up with you. Can we discuss the cricket or the football? Policy makers, ministers are not necessarily interested in these acronyms. They're not necessarily interested in the standards being developed, but they are interested in the effect of those standards and those protocols. They are interested when they're told by me or someone else that minister, some of the adoption of these protocols will affect the implementation or the effectiveness of the legislation you're putting through on online safety, that some of these protocols may affect the long-standing policy that ministers have signed up to in, in eradicating child abuse images. If we tell them that, they'll say, well, why don't you do something about it? You know, I pay you don't pay you much, but, you know, I pay you to be officials and to intervene and to do something about this. And, of course, we say this is a multi-stakeholder process, this is bottom-up, and there are many p different players in the room. And, of course, there are many different players in the room. But we have to be there. We have to be part of this discussions. The, the second point I want to make is on... On, on choice and the uh, the very informative presentation that you know Peter gave, and I heard some other presentations on this. And again, if we told ministers about choice in terms of selecting your recursive resolver, he'd say, again, please, you know, don't tell me what recursive resolvers are. So you know, let's not talk about choice. You know, people don't have a choice. It's like the net neutrality debate, you know, that we had 25 years ago. You know, I remember being told, you know, when we were discussing net neutrality in the European Union, you know, that there was a choice, that consumers had a choice to, you know, if you had an internet service provider that blocked social media, don't worry, dear boy, you can go and choose another internet service provider. You know, what tosh, you know, 
years contract, two years contract, three years contract. Come on. So it's important that we don't you know, hide behind choice in terms of the quality of, of our systems. And to finish with, because I've probably gone over time, I want to say that it's fantastic the work that has been done and that is taking place. And I've mentioned you know, the great work of, 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 of academic institutions, etc. But the fact that we can meet in ICANN as the Government Advisory Committee, the fact that governments can interact and work with people like Keith at Verisign and, and the ICANN board, that we can have our say in terms of the involvement of the DNS, that we can work in the IETF, that we can work with the experts in the IETF. Yes, it's complicated and it's far too complicated for me sometimes, but the IETF is open to governments participating in their processes, and that is to be welcomed. And the regional internet registries, the way that they involve governments, whether it's APNIC or uh, others, I mean, it, it truly is, uh, you know, very welcoming. So that's all I've got to say, and thank you. Thank you, Nigel. The most very... important perspective. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, no, I was just thanking for the very important government perspective, but back to you. Thank you so much. It's a little bit complicated to coordinate the in-room uh, and the remote participants. Sorry about that. And uh, just a question. Is there any other in the room that would like to uh, speak? Uh, I was looking at Mark uh, before. Not sure if you would like to, to go ahead. Exactly. I would suggest that we go now for Mark remarks and then also passing back the word to Emily afterwards, because I think we also have some points being raised online. Okay. Thank you very much, panelists. Thank you very much, everyone. Uh, this is Mark Dadesgaard speaking. I am a member of the ICON Genesis Council and chair of the group on DNS abuse from the council. Um, I come here, I would like to believe speaking on behalf of my group and would like to socialize a few points that might be of interest uh, to the session in particular. Um, as Keith mentioned, there has been very active debate this year concerning DNS abuse, but not in the generalistic sort of amorphous way that it had been in the past this year we have made some very realistic progress and started to uh, get to the nitty-gritty of policy and the way this was accomplished i think um, was by really uniting the members of uh, the, the the different stakeholders in ICANN for a greater cause instead of focusing on our differences we really got together and started thinking about what do we want to accomplish in terms of the security of the internet and this was fortuitous because it re it united both the non-contracted parties so civil society businesses uh, end users and the contracted parties represented here by keith but uh we have many of them here uh who are the registries and registrars uh we managed to get together in this group and reach some consensus which is you know uh supposed to be the the, the broader point of what we are doing but very rare um, so we are moving ahead with a letter from the council to, to the contracted parties and I can to renegotiate asking them, you know, uh, it's a, it's a, it's an ask to renegotiate contracts to change the responsibility because something we didn't know at the beginning of this process was I can doesn't have the power to actually enforce anything. They can send very strongly worded letters to malicious actors saying what you're doing is very evil, which you know, I, I won't be soft here. It's completely useless. So the team is really was really working towards how can we change this reality. And the letter that the, the contractor party house sent uh, a few um, a few weeks ago was very encouraging because they even preempted their own letter. So this was very this made us actually very happy because it signifies that everybody's on board that we want to start moving ahead and start cornering these malicious actors with not, you know, strongly worded letters, but with actu actually talking to them as in, this has consequences, you have to do something. This is not a problem for someone uh, in the cloud to solve, it's, it's your problem. We sell a product, the DNS is a product, it is a te technical standard, but at the end of the day, it is a commercial product that is employed across the world. It is our responsibility to, to keep it intact because there are many competitors arising 
we don't want to 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 make it easy for all these different compactors many different resolution systems that are emerging to just say hey the dns sucks so come use ours we need to keep making this product better and we need to work together as a community to do that and this is more of a partially an update partially a big thank you to, to the icon community for being so involved to contract the parties for being so generous in their time and hoping that next year we can bring another update saying hey we accomplished this things are going better than we thought so thank you very much for the space uh, panelists uh, organizers it, it's a pleasure to be here and for sharing all this information thank you mark thank you uh let's go back to uh second round with the panelists starting with jeff uh, Jeff, uh, a reply, your views. Thank you, Pablo. And uh, I'd actually like to start with Emily's question and make a more general observation and, and move on from there. Emily asked about query data. And in actual fact, it's important because the DNS is actually two parts. One is provisioning zone files, publishing the information. And oddly enough, it's really easy to talk about provisioning and there's a lot of data around, but that's not what's important. What's important is query data, how it's used. And the problem there is query data is extraordinarily hard, hard to find. And I know that only too well as a researcher in this space. The issue is that real query data has incredible privacy implications and <clears throat> Most operators just simply don't release it for extremely good reasons. And now they, some try and obfuscate the data to make it, you know, well, we can publish this, but you can't see any personal data. But the obfuscation makes it largely useless. And so our efforts at APNIC uh, in looking at the way queries happen, who resolves names, etc., have had some limited success in exposing query patterns, even the emerging centralization in DNS servers, but that behavior observation is peeking through a window that I think is getting smaller every single day as more and more of these privacy efforts just shut that down. I actually believe that where we're heading is an outcome that there'll be nothing less to see in the DNS, no data, nothing. And in my view, no policy, no regulation can alter this trajectory. What we're talking about here are the actions and behaviors of applications. And frankly, trying to exercise regulatory impost on the way the DNS behaves as a protocol is about the same as trying to regulate the fine-grained behavior of Microsoft Word or even the fine-grained behavior of the Chrome browser. We've never tried it in the past and I don't think it's ever gonna happen in the future. So oddly enough, what we're finding now, it's been a convenient coincidence of motives for both the large operators in today's internet, Google, Apple, and so on, and their perception of what users want in terms of privacy that has led to this push to change a lot of the, the technology landscape in the DNS. And with this ascendancy of applications as the dominant factor in the internet system and the suppression of networks, they're no longer important. There is a strong aversion by applications to allow any part of the network to gain any insight at all into the behavior of the application, its content, or any information that it's gathering. And if you want just one example, and I'll go back and quote back to Nigel, quick is really important because this is an excellent example, the best we see today, of taking the entire function of transport application and content and loading it up into the application and hiding everything from the network, the platform, and anyone else. It's lifted it up and then hidden it entirely. So I think the DNS is heading in the same direction. DNS over HTTPS is incredibly important because at some point, if you think about it, with server push, there are no more queries. They just disappear. The server pre-provisions the DNS to the user. The server asks for nothing. There is no query data left to find. So if you thought this DNS is a common piece of network infrastructure, then I think that view is being superseded by the view that the DNS is just an application artifact. Now, the implication of that observation is profoundly disturbing. It enters into areas of splintering and fragmentation as each application customizes their view of the namespace 
to suit their purpose. And the residual value of a common namespace with a single root declines inevitably. And all of this operates behind a veil of encryption and obscured traffic. It's going to be trial highly challenging to even see what's happening, let alone try and prevent these forces of destructive entropy. And so the inevitable outcome here is something that, where I said was highly challenging, and by highly challenging, I really mean impossible. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jeff. That's a that's a powerful statement, and I think it's going to set up um, uh, the the remainder of the conversation. Um, we'd like to just cycle back through the other uh, panelists for for final remarks now. Mallory, could I throw to you, please? Yes, and I endeavor to take less time because I've already spoken too much. Um, but just two additional points um, um, that I failed to make clear before as well. Um, so just a slight quibble with the direction of travel for encrypted DNS. I don't think it's only that users have asked big providers for more privacy. I think that the engineers at the IETF and elsewhere have made better protocols. They have understood where um, DNS filtering is basically a hack, to use a technical term. <laughs> it doesn't work well, it's easily circumvented, and the protocol needed to evolve. And this is actually um, just better engineering overall. And that you know, filtering by DNS was never really a good approach anyway. And um, mitigating um, other kinds of abuse, um, they, they need to come up with different approaches. So I um, wanted to make those additional points on that, um, but otherwise um, really appreciate this panel and the discussion from everyone. Thanks. Thanks, Mallory. Peter, final remarks from you? Yes, I, I'd be happy. Um, I, I didn't have my hand up, but um... The, the the discussion uh, the evolving discussion made me uh, made me realize to 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 add a point to or an observation to this discussion that the um, the fact that DNS becomes useless as a filtering tool a monitoring tool or point of control for governments uh, regulators uh, means that the pressure is just going to shift I mean there there's not going to be a hands up in the air and we give up on, on enforcing public policy. Um, so we, we see already that it's shifting to, to the different uh, actor and, and that in this case is our, the, the registry operators and the registrars um, who are getting pulled more and more into the, the debates, not just on um, the, the fight against abuse, but also the prevention of abuse. Um, and, and before we, we know it, we'll, uh, we'll be in a minority report scenario uh, where when somebody is registering a domain now, the expectations are increasing that it's able to, that we're able to predict whether that domain will be uh, used for abusive or criminal purposes or not. So um, I, I, I think there, it, it's, it's important to, to realize that uh, this, this will be a continuing discussion between those uh, willing to enforce public policy goals, um, possibly no matter what, um, and, and those that uh, understand the impact uh, on, on the global internet, um, the, the unified internet, and are, and are preventing to, uh, and are trying to prevent its continuing splintering. Thanks. Peter, awesome. Uh BG, Carolina, um, if you would like uh, to go ahead, if you would like to give uh, time to discussion afterwards, that's also fine. Keith, let me know. Okay, um, I, I find out that we're just uh, very similar to what Peter just talks about, which is, uh, are we going to talking about dealing with abuse or are we going to look at ways in which we can defend the abuse? Um, more and more we we see um, by merely looking at some of the names you're asking yourself what would this be used for and I, I think um, law enforcement needs to collaborate more and more with registry um, operators, especially CCTLDs in Africa, to try to see 
how we can work together. We're having a bit of trouble hearing you well. Be We got the central element of uh, collaboration and also collaboration with law enforcement. Uh, let's move on. Any other pal panelists? If not, um, Pablo, there's a question in the online chat. Mm -hmm. May Andrew Kempling, oh, oh, Keith has his hand up as well. Madeline, let me just um, ask the IT support to mute the the delayed reception of the stream. And then also Nigel wants to take the floor for a final remark. Keith and then Nigel. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, and hello again, everybody. Um, so I think when it comes to collaboration, um, I think there is very good work going on right now, as uh, Mark Datiskeld mentioned a moment ago, in the ICANN community, within the GTLD space, uh, registries, registrars, and other parts of the community. Um, but as I said earlier, there are so many different aspects to the operators of DNS or those associated with DNS that I, I think we need to start thinking a, a bit more broadly uh, about how we can expand our multi-stakeholder dialogue about better information sharing, better collaboration across the various actors that I described earlier with different roles, responsibilities, and capabilities. Um, and we really need to make sure that we include governments, law enforcement, civil society, especially as it relates to, you know, actions that are being requested or demanded or regulated on DNS operators to mitigate abuse. Um, I think that there are some real questions about um, transparency, recourse for those that are negatively impacted. We have to make sure that we're designing policies and regulations and laws that are focused on uh, proportionality and provenance, provenance being you know, as close to the source of the harm as possible, right? So we don't end up with disproportionate uh, negative impacts across the ecosystem and to potential end users. So I, I think that there's some additional work that we need to do as a multi-stakeholder community to carry on these conversations, and especially when it relates to content, um, where we need to bring in the right con, you know, the the right players, the right operators, including the hosting service providers to make sure that they are part of the conversation because generally speaking, they are not engaged at ICANN today. Uh, ICANN's bylaws for everybody's benefit actually restrict ICANN from developing policies um, and you know, contractual requirements related to content. So I think that there is a, there's a gap here that I think we are starting to see about the need for better collaboration, better communication. Um, you know, perhaps there's some uh, systems that could be developed for better collaboration and communication across the various actors, but we really need to continue to expand this multi-stakeholder dialogue to include the hosting service providers, government, civil society, uh, and the other actors in the DNS ecosystem to make sure that we're raising the bar and sharing information to, so we can mitigate DNS abuse as a very broad concept, right? DNS security threats are one thing, DNS abuse is a very broad term. And in order to be able to address that, we need to have more people at the table and we need to have that multi-stakeholder dialogue so we can find the right balance. So thanks very much. I really appreciate the opportunity to be here today. No, thank you, Keith. Really, really glad that you could join us. Um, Nigel, you're, you're uh, next in the queue, I believe. Yes, thanks very much. And uh, yeah, I mean, following Keith, yeah, great, uh, great work. Uh, I, I just really wanted to reflect on one point I didn't didn't cover, and that is the importance of this debate not just to, to to national governments, but also to the sort of global internet ecosystem, if I might put it that way. As you know, there are UN discussions taking place on on, on cybercrime. There are UN discussions taking place on cybersecurity. We have the UN Global Digital Compact, and the Tech Envoy, who has been here with us in. Uh, 
in, uh, in Addis this week is, is considering what elements, what policy issues on the internet should be covered in the Global Digital Compact. And then, of course, in 2025, we have the uh, WISIS Plus 20 review process debate at the, uh, at the UNGA. And that will be very important indeed. Uh, it will probably use terminology that's equally as confusing as quick and natural relay or, or, or whatever. But it will set the agenda going on from 2025. And some governments will no doubt reflect, whether for good reasons or bad, that, you know, that the internet has had enough of multi-stakeholder cooperation, that all this chaos, the inability to perhaps to do things that governments thought they could do is a result of this bottom-up multi-stakeholder process. It's a result of the uh, decision by the US to set up ICANN. It's a result of decisions that uh, non-for-profit bodies should give out IP addresses. And there will be a debate. And some governments might well say, well, yeah, perhaps the UN could do it better. Now, you know, we might laugh at that. Uh, we might say, well, you know, that's absurd. You know, the internet itself is an ecosystem that involves all actors. But the pendulum could swing. And so this is the importance, I think, of being able to say, well, yeah, there are problems, there are, you know, issues, but the multi-stakeholder community, the standard bodies, uh, ICANN, other institutions are doing their best to tackle these problems. Thanks. Thanks very much, Nigel. Um, Carolina Aguera, did you have a, some final remarks you'd like to make? The final remark is to um, embed this debate into the like the broader um, debates around um, open data and 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 uh, privacy uh, over over the last years and how the pendulum uh, regarding open science open research is is kind of really uh, not shifting in a in a positive way uh, and I'm glad that this is being addressed in 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 the an internet governance in the internet governance forum um because uh, this uh the, the closing of spaces um is is kind of knowledge and and data sharing and understanding is really uh not uh productive for for these meaningful multi-stakeholder dialogues and engagements based on an evidence-based uh, policy making space so it's very contradictory what what we are seeing here uh in terms of what we we want to aim 17 years on in the igf with what we are actually seeing happening at the uh, internet uh, architecture and um, and I, I really think that we we need to sort of um, garner uh, energy for uh, uh, building up this uh, multi-stakeholder spaces so that there is actual uh, common ground for for discussing this and not just from a political standpoint but also that where we can sustain some uh, some dis some discussions on 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 data and and evidence that we are all uh, familiar and aware of. Um, thank you. Thanks, Carolina. Now um, we're we're almost out of time, but Andrew Campling has been making some some really interesting comments in the um, chat, which we thought it would be nice to introduce to to the room as well. Andrew, would you like to just take a minute and um, and sum up your thoughts? Uh, surely. Uh, th thank you, uh, Madeline, uh, and thanks, panelists, for a, a really interesting uh, uh, discussion. Uh, I'll rattle through these really quickly, um, uh, just to uh, uh, amplify what I said in the chat. Um, so, uh, as you would have seen from my comments, I think that some of the claims related to the privacy benefits of encrypted uh, DNS are, um, if I'm being kind, questionable. Um, the, yes, they do obscure the queries to a network based uh, ob observer, but of course the queries are still visible to the resolver operator um, and to um, uh, uh, sort of software running uh, on the endpoint. Uh, resolveless uh, DNS uh, m maybe removes the, uh, um, the observation from the resolver operator from the equation, but again, you're still exposed to. Uh, software on, um, on the endpoint. Um, 
what we seem to have conveniently overlooked, and this is usually the case, is uh, most of the worst privacy violations uh, are undertaken by the companies that operate some of those open resolvers um, and, and the companies that, that run the software that's on our endpoints. Uh, yeah, we've all heard of surveillance capitalism and uh, you know, the really egregious privacy violations that, that continue uh, to this day. Um, so. Uh, and, and we, I think we also tend to conflate privacy and security quite often, um, ignore the fact that uh, DNS is a key, uh, amongst other things is a key indicator of compromise. Um, um, so we weaken our cyber defenses um, if that's taken out of the equation. Um, and also the resolver operators often uh, um, are based in the US and it, there's no GDPR protection uh, in the US. Um, there's no federal uh, privacy laws. Um, so uh, uh, again, we, we lose legislative uh, protections uh, as well, which is unhelpful. Uh, so if we are to talk about the security of the internet, let, let's get to grips with the real underlying issues. You know, let's talk about surveillance capitalism and, ha and how we deal with that. Uh, uh, you know, let's uh, address the issues increasingly posed by um, centralization and the loss of resilience uh, of infrastructure. Um, which is being aided and abetted by things like uh, uh, in encrypted DNS and uh, uh, centralization uh, of the uh, sort of DNS uh, infrastructure. Um, and, and frankly, and finally, um, you know, a lot of the uh, uh, internet standards uh, de developments have significant um, um, policy implications. Uh, and uh, we need, as, as Nigel said, we need more governments, more civil society groups, uh, uh, more representation from industry um, within standards bodies like the ITF. Uh, these standards are far too important to leave to the uh, tech industry. Um, because that, as I said at the start, has got a vested interest. Uh, it's operating the surveillance capitalism. So we need other voices in there um, to make sure we, we get better solutions. Thanks. Thank you, Andrew. I think we're soon to arrive to the end. I hope uh, we were able to meet the expectations of Emily and Carolina, the ones that proposed these. Madeline, um, I learned quite a bit here. I would like to just ask you quickly, what are your key takeaway? And also for the purposes of the report, we need to uh, add a couple of actions to take. Um, so one takeaway, one action, and then perhaps we close um, uh, after you revert that question to me. Thanks, Pablo. Um, and thanks to everyone who participated today. Um, I think my takeaway is that it's really important that we think when we are, when we arrive at, at, um, at these, these uh, problems or questions, we always arrive at them at, at, at the current point in time. Um, and we, we think back on what's happened and how we've arrived at where we are. But I think, from the conversation today, um, it's really important that we think ahead to the next 20 years or 50 years and, and kind of look back at this moment from the future and consider what steps did we take now. Internet governance, as we're all very familiar, has, has, has emerged you know, quite organically. And when we've made mistakes or when things haven't worked out as we expected them to, it's really important that we can go back and and um, or that we can address those and rectify them. So I think we need to be we need to be considering our actions now in the context of the future. And I think it's, the action is that we we've, we've really I just think that IGF is, is such an important forum for bringing together government, um, uh, industry, the tech community, um, civil society, and, and academia to really have these these uh, conversations. So I think we need to think about a follow on discussion for next year. What are your Definitely. what are your takeaways, Pablo, and, and your your call for action? Well, I, I take it from what Mark said, it is uh, a commercial product, he said, but it is actually uh, a massive uh, collaboration of uh, different entities that uh, ultimately operate uh, these uh, very important um, infrastructure at the technical level. Uh, so while this collaboration performs uh, well uh, technically, it also has many layers of policy making 
uh, it's a very heavily regulated uh, industry, uh, but at the same time, I do feel that there are important governance and policy questions that still remain, that they are out from the ICANN sphere, uh, that they are um, subject of a very good conversation at the IGF. Uh, and as you said, I think uh, we need to explore a little bit more about it. And um, key actions to take, well, um, uh, more of these discussions uh, at the IGF in Japan. And what do you think? I think another session in Japan. Thank you very much, everyone. And all the very best to uh, all. We can close the session here. Thanks, Thank everyone. Thank you, Pablo. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Madeline. Ciao.